Welcome, everyone. Hello. So uh, it's about time to get started, so here we go. Here is Yana to talk about the future of the internet. <laughs> and uh, make him welcome. Thank you so much. Can you all hear me in the back now? Is this loud enough? Yeah. Wonderful. Excellent. I can shout too, and I usually will. By about 20 minutes into the talk, my voice will go up a pitch. Uh, that's a good thing. Um, thank you all for being here. As I say, I, we know you have choices, but thank you for flying with us. Um, I hope this is fun, and I hope this is, this is interesting. Um, this is about to change your lives anyways, so it's good that you know about what's about to change your lives. Um, we're going to be talking about, well, I'm going to be talking about, and uh, uh, about Quick. Um, how many of you have heard about Quick here? Just a very quick show of hands. Oh, my God. And not on this agenda. <laughs> okay, good. Just making sure. Um, how many of you have read the internet drafts? Good. Because I didn't want to have a working group meeting here. Um, <laughs> that would not be fun. I just came from one. Uh, so this is, well, I'm going to call it the mother of all internet transports. That is officially what it's called. No, it's not. But uh, you'll see why. Um, I work at Google, and I'm also one of the uh, uh, co-editors of the quick drafts at the IETF. How many of you uh, do not know what the IETF is? No, raise your hand. It's OK. Well, I'll be very, very quick about this because it's useful. The IETF is the body that builds rights internet standards. So your TCP and your IP and your HTTP and the things that you do with your computers right now instead of listening to me, all of that is happening because of IETF protocols. So um, the IETF standardizes protocols. And Quick is getting standardized at the IETF. I'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, there are resources. Uh, we have a paper that was published at ACM SICOM uh, last year. Um, and we have an IETF working group which has activity and um, such. You can find these online. So a very quick history. Um, quick was built as a protocol for HTTP transport. So the thing that takes HTTP over to the other side. So the thing that sits under HTTP. Uh, and it was deployed at Google starting in 2014. Um, we deployed it initially between Google services, all Google services, and Chrome, and uh, Google first party apps, as we call them, like YouTube uh, search apps. Uh, that we deploy on Android. Um, and we found it to be very good. We found that deploying Quick improved our application performance significantly. These numbers, uh, for context, are extremely high. These are application metrics and moving application metrics, not networking benchmarks. These are full application metrics. Those are very hard to do in general, especially for applications like Google Search. You can imagine Google Search is an extremely optimized application. And moving those numbers by, by about 8% is uh, somewhat absurd. But we were able to move search latency between 3.6 and 8% and YouTube rebuffers by 15 to 18%. I'll talk about a little bit more about these metrics later. But these are enormous numbers. And so we obviously wanted to deploy Quick all over. And we deployed Quick uh, all through Google. Basically, between Google and all of Chrome and, and uh, uh, YouTube and other applications on Android, if you're using right now Chrome to, uh, to go to YouTube, there's a pretty darn good chance, about an 88% chance that you're using Quick. And uh, it's now, uh, it, these numbers are slightly dated. It's higher than these, but it's at least 35% of Google's egress traffic, which ends up being about 7%, 7 to 10% of the internet itself. So about 7 to 10% of internet traffic is right now Quick. We created an IETF working group in uh, 2016 to, to modularize and standardize quick. Um, I'll go over these things. By the way, if you have any questions, please raise your hands. I hate, I hate to wait until 40 minutes in, and then you go, by the way, you said something on the first slide. Um, I don't mind responding to them then, but if you have questions, feel free to ask, uh, and I'll decide whether I'm going to answer them or not. That's what I get. I have the mic, see? Um, so. How did Google's quick deployment look like? We'll get into the technology just a bit. I know that you're chomping at the bit to get there. But what does the deployment look like? 
So here's a, a graph of our traffic, our quick traffic increasing uh, at Google. On the x-axis, we have just time. And on the y-axis is percentage of Google's egress bytes that are going over quick. So you can see that we started somewhere in, you know, early, in, in, in late, mid, mid to late 2014, and we were steadily increasing uh, quick traffic uh, uh, out from Google. And by the way, this is replacing existing TCP, right? So uh, as this is going up, TCP traffic is going down. Um, so things are going up steadily and things are looking wonderful and then that happens. It was fun. Um, that happened to be a, a, a security a, a, a bug that we had in our clients, uh, which allowed them to send, uh, uh, there's some details in the paper, but we sent some uh, initial, this was a very rare chance, but it did happen uh, uh, where we sent some uh, initial uh, requests potentially unencrypted. And that was bad, so we shut it down immediately, fixed the bug, and rolled out a fix, and we started uh, um, um, back, caught back up to where we should have been. Everything was good, and then that happened in August of 2016. Anybody want to venture a guess what that might be? Olympics, no. Olympics didn't keep going on for several months. <laughs> Google Pixel, no. Year's election? elections didn't go on for several months. Uh, well, actually, the year's election goes on all the time, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Vulnerabilities, no. Uh, that, that would have been a good one, actually, but no. Um, yeah, yeah, no, this wasn't that. But that would have been a good one. Last one. Yes. Uh, no. Although that would have been awesome. I mean, I mean, I wish. It's happening. No, it's actually something far, far simpler. You, these are excellent answers, but I wish I had those stories to tell right now. <laughs> I have one story, which I hope I get to at the end, but not that one. But anyways, this, this was basically us turning it on all the way for YouTube app on Android phones. So up until here, we were doing it for everything. We were doing a limited amount of YouTube app because there was sort of, we had to fix some uh, performance issues in it. But uh, we were doing desktop all the way, mobile for everything, except for YouTube app. Turned on YouTube app in August of 2016. Traffic doubles. So if any of you have any questions about whether the future is mobile or not, there's your answer. It is mobile. Um, it's a tremendous amount of traffic. Um, all right, so what are we talking about? What is this thing? What is this quick? I said HTTP transport, stuff like that. Here's a schematic to help you understand very briefly what it is. We'll talk about why it's good and so on later, but this is just what it is. So here's your standard stack. This is your, uh, if you've seen A, uh, if you heard about the internet stack, here it is. There's your IP, there's your TCP sitting on top of it, there's your TLS that provides crypto on top of it, TCP gives you a connection, and you know, makes the internet look less chaotic and absurd than it really is. And TLS gives you more security than, uh, uh, than anything else can give you below it. And HTTP2 sits on top of that and gives you uh, um, HTTP, right? So this is what we've got. And, and here's Quick. Quick basically sits on top of UDP and replaces pretty much all of TCP, TLS, and most of HTTP2. So it's a protocol that subsumes a whole bunch of other protocols, and it gets a lot of benefits for, for sort of vertically integrating the stack. All right? We'll get into the details a little bit. There's a little bit of a shim there so that you know, HTTP can work on top of Quick, but that's roughly the idea. I'll break this down a little bit more. Specifically, Quick has inside it a handshake algorithm, a crypto handshake algorithm, but we combine effectively the crypto handshake and the transport handshake. If you look at TCP and TLS, they have different handshake mechanisms. TCP does its handshake and then TLS does its handshake. We're able to combine that in quick, right? So that's one of the benefits you get for combining vertical uh, layers of the stack. Uh, and we call that quick crypto. So this was built in-house. Quick crypto was developed in-house and we, it had some properties which I'll talk about in a moment. But then Quick did other things such as TCP like congestion control, loss recovery, various things that UDP does not give you, but TCP does. 
because we were building this on top of UDP, we had to build a lot of functionality on our own. And we did it better. Of course we did it better. Why wouldn't we? Um, so this is what Google Quick looks like. A, a brief aside, this is uh, 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 now getting standardized at the IETF. And since we developed this, since Google Quick Crypto came out, TLS 1.3 has come about, which has a lot of the same properties as Quick Crypto. Not surprisingly, it was inspired to some degree by Quick Crypto. But at the same time, it also uh, uh, satisfies a lot of the needs that we had at the time, which were not met by TLS 1.2. And so the idea of Quick work that we are doing now is basically going to replace Quick Crypto with TLS 1.3 in addition to doing other significant changes to the protocol, which won't have substantial bearing on the performance. But if they do, they, they should make it better. Um, so this is, this is what Quick is. This is where Quick sits in the schematic, in the stack. Um, but why did we go about doing all of this? This replaces a huge chunk of what we typically consider as a standard internet stack. It's a fair amount of effort. And we undertook this. Why? Uh, it was worth it for us, of course. But before I get into the details of why, I just want to start with, what's a web page? Let's have the basics. How many of you here understand HTTP 2? Let me start from there and down. Oh, good heavens. Uh, how many of you understand? Well, if you understand HTTP 2, then I'm going to breeze through this very quickly. All right? So uh, uh, humor me as I'm going through this. A web page has a lot of objects. This is, this is for the benefit of those of you who don't. I got about 40% of the room raising their hands with HTTP2. But for the others who don't, I want to walk through up until HTTP2 and just show you quickly what you get in HTTP2. Um, so we've got a web page has a ton of objects. And HTTP1 basically first sets up a connection. And to do that, you'll get a round trip to do a TCP connection and then about two round trips to set up a TLS 1.2 connection. Right? So it takes a fair amount of time to set up a connection. And then requests and responses flow over this connection. And the way that happens is, let's say there's a web, web server here with objects, and there's a client here, and there's one uh, uh, TLS over TCP connection. Right? The client will first request an object, get the object. And then it requests the next object and gets the next object. Requests the third object, gets the third object. Do you see a problem with this? Sorry? Synchronous. Synchronous. Head of, line blocking. Head of line blocking. Thank you. Keyword. Yes. Head of line blocking. Can we do better than this? Yes. What do I mean by head of line blocking? If you have a large object that's coming down your way, the small objects that are, that are behind it are stuck. Because there's a single connection, the large object has to get delivered before the small objects can be requested. So that's annoying, annoying. Can we do better? Any ideas how we might do better on this? More connections, yes. Multiplexing. Multiplexing, yes. Excellent. You stubbed one, one ahead. But yes, both of those are very good answers. Right? So what the simple thing that browsers did in the day was to basically simply use multiple connections for multiple objects. This allows you to multiplex in, in, in sort of a crude way, but it's not good enough because you're opening a connection which can be heavyweight for every object. Not just as a heavyweight, having multiple connections sort of defeats a lot of transport functionality purposes. I mean, it puts connections competing with each other on the network and so on. So it's nicer to have a single connection. And so we can do better than this, which is where we go next with HTTP2, which deals with head of line blocking by creating these things called streams within a transport connection that allow you to multiplex these objects within a transport connection. So HTTP2 will take multiple objects, break them into pieces, and ship the node. Think, um, um, yeah, basically, that's, that's what we're doing here. So um, that's what HTTP2 does. Do you see any problems with this? Yes? Packet losses will solve the whole thing. This is a different kind of head of line blocking. It's happening at the transport, though, because TCP is a bit pipe. And it's a serialized, it's a single sequential bit pipe. So you send stuff down one way, stuff comes out the other way in the same order. So even if you're multiplexing things within a single TCP connection, loss that happens on one object will block subsequent bytes that may belong to completely different objects. So yes. Anything else? Well, that's good. Let's just run with that for now, shall we? There are some other issues. I'll talk about them in a moment. 
But yes, that's a pretty significant problem. So here are some unresolved problems. Um, the first one is, well, we still have this connection setup latency. Web pages tend, users and user experience of, of visiting websites tends to be quite, the first few, for the first period of time tends to be quite critical. So uh, dealing with connection setup latency is an important problem, right? And web pages tend to be small as well. There are small web pages. Think again, Google search, for example, uh, which is um, um, supposed to be small. Um, but there are, there are plenty of pages that are small. And if your latency, setup latency is three round trips and the page itself is one round trip, you're paying a significant <coughs> overhead for, for just getting that one, one page of one round trip. Um, so we'd still like to deal with that. Does this mean anything to anybody here? Yeah. All right. Anybody want to say anything about this? Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> do not want. Very good. Yes. So firewalls. Yes. Well, firewalls also do this stuff. But there are the problem. The problem here, in a nutshell, is that TCP. Uh, 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 basically is a, a protocol from quite a while ago, right? And so, so all the headers are out in the open. And today we have an ecosystem the, where, where basically there are plenty of middle boxes. We call them middle boxes because they're neither the client nor the server, neither one end nor the other. They're sitting in the middle. And they're not supposed to be looking at the TCP header according to the original internet architecture. The current internet architecture is not at all like that. We have plenty of middle boxes that basically look at whatever they can look at. And there's a whole massive industry around these boxes now. Um, and they will basically terminate, commonly terminate TCP connections. And they will, uh, uh, they look at the header, they modify the header, they do various things. The problem here is that it makes it really difficult for us to change TCP itself. So if we wanted to change TCP and we said, hey, uh, server, do you speak this new fangled TCP that I want to speak? And the server says, yes, let's go for it and I change something on the wire, suddenly things break. And that's because there's a middle box in the middle, possibly, that doesn't know this change that I've deployed and is not part of the negotiation. It can't say no, or it doesn't say no, because it doesn't know to say no. So there's a real problem here where we've been trying to deploy changes to TCP. TCP fast open, um, MPTCP, these are things that we've developed, built, uh, tried to deploy, and it's hard, hard, hard to deploy them. TCP fast open, if any of you are familiar with this, uh, uh, has been in Linux for quite a while now, and it's still not deployed widely. Apple's been trying to deploy the uh, TCP fast open for, 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 a, for a, a couple of years now, and it's, it's hard because of middle boxes again, random strange failures that happen in the network when you use this stuff. Was that a question? Yes. Uh, load, uh, Sorry? Packet level load balancers should be fine. They don't need to look at connection level information, like transport level information, but firewalls and various other middle boxes do. So, all right, so middle box interference with TCP is a real issue that we'd like to solve as well, because we'd like to evolve TCP, we'd like to evolve the transport for future uses, future needs of, of, uh, um, of, for the web. And finally, head of line blocking within TCP. That's a performance issue. So we'd like to solve these problems. And now let's look at how HTTP or quick works. First, the connection setup. The quick way is basically zero round trips. How low can you get? Zero. We try to get there. Um, what zero round trips means is that the client will send a handshake packet and immediately send the request following it. It's able to do that if it has spoken to the server before. The request is not in plain text, it's encrypted. And the reason it's encrypted is because I've spoken to the server before. So I remember the server's credentials, use those to encrypt, ship. So that's roughly how TLS 1.3 also works. So we are able to do this in Quick and in Quick Crypto and in TLS 1.3 uh, to a known server. If you've hit a server, as it turns out, server locality is, is a thing. If you hit a server, you keep hitting the server again and again. If you get your news from BBC, you will go there every morning. So there's a pretty good chance that you'll keep hitting the same server again and again. And, and even in a short time scale, you have many objects. You go to one page, now you browse over to another page, same origin. So you end up going to the same server again and again. So you might end up establishing connections to the same server again and again. And so zero round trip time is, is, is incredibly useful. Um, 
And if your crypto cues are, are the, the crypto keys are not new, or if it's, a, if, if it's the first time you're talking to a server, then you end up spending about one round of time. This is still an improvement over TCP and TLS because we are able to combine the handshake. And if we need to do version negotiation, which is extremely rare, we end up doing two round trips. But after setup, the requests and responses flow over the connection. And here's, here's how this maps to what we saw before. If you remember earlier with TCP, there was basically one serialized bit pipe. But in Quick, basically these HTTP streams map over Quick streams, which also go over the wire as Quick streams. Now they're packetized in a particular way, but the key here is that Quick knows this application structure. Quick knows that these are independent units that it can deliver to the application. So if there's loss of one object, it doesn't need to block subsequent objects from getting delivered. So Quick is aware of the structure that's there in the data. TCP was not. That's the fundamental difference here. So these are the design aspirations that we had for Quick when we started off wanting to build this. It's been a long time, but this is what we wanted to build. We wanted to build a protocol that was deployable, on the current internet, we wanted it like yesterday, and we wanted it to be evolvable, which means that 10 years from now, we want to be able to keep changing this. This has been a problem with TCP that we've not been able to change this easily. And these remain aspirations as we continue Quick's design through the IETF. Um, this is, by the way, the reason also that we, we uh, built it over UDP. We wanted it to be deployable over the current internet, and with middle boxes, you can't do anything over IP directly. Separately, we also wanted it to be in user space because we wanted to ship it inside of Chrome. So uh, putting it on UDP made sense for us to do this. Um, we wanted low connection establishment, as I pointed out, stream multiplexing, which is the you know, multiplexing of packets uh, of, of application data structures over a connection. And we wanted to do better loss recovery and more flexible congestion control. We wanted to be able to experiment with new congestion controllers, uh, which is possible to do in TCP and in Linux for sure, but the, but the bar tends to be higher and it's kind of harder to do. Um, but we wanted to be able to experiment rapidly with congestion controllers. We wanted that. That's a little bit of code structure, how we allowed pluggable congestion control to exist in our code. But um, we definitely wanted to bake in better loss recovery because that tends to be quite important for performance. Um, so. We did a number of things in the protocol itself. I will not go into the details here and put you to sleep right after lunch. Uh, but if you're interested, there are a number of things that we've done in the protocol that are different, that learn from TCP and past experiences and transports. I mean, we we basically pulled in all the lessons that we could from, from various transports of the past. Um, okay. Um, and we wanted resilience to NAT rebinding. TCP connections can survive NAT rebinding, specifically NATs. Are you familiar with, the, with what I, when I say NAT rebinding, how many of you do not know what I'm talking about? Okay, so when you have packets, when you have a connection going through your home firewall or your home NAT, your home router, what do you call the home, your home router basically, your home router is doing something in there. It's basically mapping your internal IP address to an external IP address. And it does that by creating a mapping table, by having a mapping table and mapping your internal connection to an external IP input, right? So it has to remember this. Now with TCP, the signaling is clear. There's a, the beginning of the connection starts with the SYN packet and the end of a connection ends with the FIN packet. And so the NAT will look for those packets to figure out when to establish state and when to tear down state. UDP, anybody know what a UDP connection looks like? Whatever it wants to, yeah. yeah. So UDP connection basically is 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 sort of a, a what's the word for it? Oxymoron. Oxymoron is the word. Good. We should do this. Is like dumb, this is playing charades. This is nice. Um, I think we do well here. Um, uh, it's an oxymoron because there is no connection in UDP. But the thing that's sitting on top of UDP, and the reason, by the way, I'll point this out. Uh, having done transport work for a fairly long time, UDP is not a transport. Anybody who tells you UDP is a transport, it's not a transport. UDP is basically a way to build a transport. Because UDP doesn't give you any real functions. I mean, technically, yes, it sits at the same layer on top of IP. But you know what? If you think about a layer as, as basically a bundle of functions, as things that you want done, UDP does squat. 
So the thing that sits on top of UDP can do more. That's the point of having UDP. That is the whole point of having it, so that you could not, you didn't have to have all of those functions underneath you. So you could build your own functions on top. Yes. Excellent question. I'm not going to get to that. But this is where you should ask the question, and you did. So wonderful. Um, because we tried doing that a long time ago. Have you heard of SCTP? Do you want to pull out a packet trace and show me how it looks on the internet right now? There's a real problem. Uh, well, this is a, not, not an inside joke. But SCTP was a protocol we tried to be built. In two, the RFC came out in 2000. We, we standardized SCTP as a, as, a, as a transport, tried to deploy it. And I was actually on that bandwagon. I worked with SCTP for seven years and wanted to get it deployed. It was hard as hell. We could not get it deployed. The biggest problem at the time, we hadn't quite fully, fully understood this problem at the time, or no, were not. I wouldn't say understood. We had our heads in the sand, basically. Um, uh, meaning that we hadn't come to terms with the fact that middle boxes were real and it was very, very hard to change them. Getting a new protocol, a new transport that sits on top of IP to work over the internet today is an impossible feat. Um, I'm exaggerating for effect, of course, but um, it's, it's really, really hard to get success with that. Um, you'll have to change a lot of these, the, these home routers. I mean, these are one of, the main, one of the main culprits in my mind, which basically have, do not, will look to see if they recognize the protocol or not. There are some studies that actually discuss how various home routers do this. But um, they often will block protocols they don't know. Or they'll put them all in a bucket. That'll be the TCP bucket, the UDP bucket, and the other bucket, which will have exactly two mappings. So you can have two connections that are not TCP or UDP. Things like that. And these are hard to change. How often do you go and how often, not do you, but uh, uh, how often do people usually upgrade their home routers? When it breaks. Exactly, when it breaks. And we can't, we, we, this is not going to break it. And even if you were going to tell me it's a matter of two or three years, that's too long. I don't have that much time. Right? And it's not worth trying to, trying to make that the norm. I don't think that's a good idea. So, the reason we do this on top of UDP is because we wanted evolvability. I will actually, um, let me show you one graph and I'll, I'll, I'll. That is the uh, uh, picture of versions that we deployed over time. Um, again, on the x-axis, you'll see just date, basically. On the y-axis, there's no y-axis. It's, it's a fraction of traffic, but you can see that we changed versions quite rapidly. We want this to be possible. And if we did this over IP, it'd be harder to do this. Um, and we wanted this to be in user space. That was the other thing. Practically, we wanted it in user space. We didn't want to rely. We didn't want Quick to have to go into you know, Mac OS and into Linux and into Windows. And you know, then Windows users will eventually, over the next 550 years, move to Windows 10 <laughs> and then actually have Quick, right? So, It'd be a lot easier to, a lot faster to do it uh, on top of um, UDP. Does that answer your question? All right. Um, so deployability and evolvability were the reasons we went on top of UDP. That, that's that's kind of key. Uh, so NATs, uh, we wanted to be resilient to NAT rebinding. So because of this UDP being, being connection-less or no connections, NATs don't know how long to hold a UDP mapping. If they see a UDP packet come, they will create a, a table mapping, ship the UDP packet out on the other side. Remember, I just said with TCP, they can see the SIN and the FIN packets, right? But the UDP, they don't know what to look for. So they have a timer. And the timer tends to be aggressive, more aggressive than TCP. So they'll have a timer, and if they don't see any more packets come for a you know, certain period of time, say about 15 seconds or so, they'll drop the mapping. What this means is that your NAT mapping within a quick connection that sits on top of UDP might change. As you're going through the connection, your NAT mapping might change. This not just happens at your home router, this happens in enterprises. There are things called enterprise NATs. These are, you know, like if the home routers are little, little things, these are like big monstrous beasts. Um, and these are also doing similar things, but they're doing them on a massive scale. And they can end up rotating through this quite rapidly as well. So, um, NAT rebinding is an issue. It is, we need to build resilience into, to NAT rebinding, which we built by having a separate identifier for connections, which we call a connection ID. 
I'm going to leave it at that and move on to the next slide. We can come back to these in more if you have more questions, but I do want to show you some data because I know you love data. So uh, there, are, there are several metrics that we tracked as we deployed quick. We looked at search latency, we looked at video latency, we looked at video rebuffer rate. Uh, I am going to only talk about search latency here. If you want more, go look at the paper, please. Uh, uh, highly encouraged. Um, Search latency is, is, is the time from when a user enters a search term to when the entire page is loaded. This is Google search again. This is the metrics that we get from looking at search latency for Google search. So I'm going to show you the mean uh, 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 changes. And I'm also going to show you breakdown by percentile. So this is basically search latency ordered. And then we look at uh, uh, latency reduction by percentile of users. Um, so the, at the mean, we were able to reduce desktop latency by 8% and mobile latency by 3.6%. Uh, and and it will become very quickly uh, clear why it is that mobile is not as high. But there are other reasons too. We are still working through making our mobile implementation work as well as the, as the uh, desktop ones. Um, if you look at the lower percentiles, if you break this down and look at the lower percentiles, that's not really that much of a win. I mean, there's wins for sure, but up until the median, you're barely getting, you're getting 1.5%. It's, it's good. It's, it's not bad. I mean, that's good enough to, to ship something, but it's not, you know, 8%, right? The tails get exciting. General lesson, tails are always the most exciting part <laughs> of a distribution. Right? It's hard to move the median on a number of things, especially on things that are entrenched, that have been sitting around for a long time, that have been optimized to death. But the tails are where new stuff lies. The tails are where interesting things happen. And fixing the tails allows us to move more users in. I'll show that in a moment as well. Um, so the tails, we saw dramatic improvements. And we are generally, I'd say, a lot of the work that you do in networking, a lot of the work that we end up doing is anyways trying to make the tails better and as a result, we slowly shift the entire distribution. But the tails are where it's at. Um, this is basically roughly similar for, for video. I won't go into that, that, those numbers here. But why is application latency lower? The, the primary reason here is the zero RTD handshake. We are able to get basically substantially reduced uh, handshake latency because of zero RTD. Uh, handshakes and quick. If you look at TCP and TLS, that's the yellow orange curve there. And uh, this is RTT, minimum RTT to the, of, of the connection on the X axis and actual handshake latency as measured at the server on the Y axis. Um, the orange, uh, the yellow, anyways, uh, curve shows you how long it takes to establish a TCP connection. This is data measured, recorded at our servers. Question? It's the TCP and the TLS handshake. Okay. It's basically the period of time from when the, uh, yes, it's, it's, it's the TCP and the TLS handshake. Because with Quick we have combined them, so yes. So Quick one RTD plus is that little line, which doesn't matter. That's, that's by the way, the worst case for us in, 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 in general, right? That's like by far the, 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 not common, but the worst case. But if you look at all Quick connections, it's sub one RTD which is like magic. But that's what caching is. It's like magic, right? Gives you zero RTT. Um, so we are able to get zero RTT for a lot of connections. And you can see this really slow going curve, growing curve that basically doesn't increase linearly with RTT, which is awesome. Because if you are in a place like, I don't know, Australia, <laughs> you might benefit from this. Um, so there's some goodness here. This is where a lot of the application latency reduction and improvement comes from for us. So this is, this is one of the take home lessons. All this is good and fine. Now let's look at how improvements look by geo, right? So South Korea, awesome RTD. Okay, 1%, not too bad. I'd expect better, but fine. Uh, you can't have everything. But 1% retransmit rate for TCP connections. All right. Uh, improvements that we can provide? 
not very much because mobile and, and the, I won't talk about rebuffer rates here very much, but you do see some improvements in rebuffer rates. Uh, but in latency, you don't see that much improvement. You go to the US, right, where you have uh, uh, RTDs of the order of uh, uh, 50 milliseconds and uh, retransmit rates are slightly higher. And now you're starting to see more improvement. Yeah? Still not, you know, something to write home about, something to get excited and explain all of this to your mother about. I'm sorry, that was a bad, <laughs> scratch that. Bad stereotype, take it off the recording, edit please. Um, apologies for saying that. Um, but yeah, not something that I would explain to my 13 year old about, you know, get him excited about quick. Um, here's India, right? We have a mean min RTD of almost 200 milliseconds, a mean re retransmit rate of 8%, and look at the improvements we are able to provide there. So the, the, the crux of this, this particular slide is there's the tail. Pulling in the tail is, helps a large number of users who really need it. And so this is not simply improving your experience sitting somewhere with highly you know, well-connected networks, um, improving your search experience or your video experience from you know, awesome to super awesome. It's actually going from usable, uh, from not usable potentially to usable. We actually see more users stay around. We actually see that people are watching videos for longer because they're using quick. That's an advantage, that's a benefit. And that's something that uh, I, wanna, I wanna make clear. This is helping users in the tail as well. So that's what quick is about. Um, I'll share one story and then we'll sh uh, switch to questions. How many minutes do I have? About eight and a half minutes, okay. So I was talking about ossification as an issue, uh, uh, where, where, I, where I, men I didn't use the word ossification yet, but I mentioned that middle boxes have uh, um, middle boxes that don't understand new TCP changes or TCP improvements or you know new TCP things basically break them because they need to move as well. This is what we call ossification. TCP is effectively ossified right now in the network. You can't really change TCP because the network has to change as well. And that's a really difficult thing to do. Um, and we, like I said, wanted to deploy quick uh, 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 as basically uh, uh, we wanted it to not ossify. We wanted it to be evolvable. One of the things that we did, I didn't mention this and I should have, quick's headers are encrypted. The transport headers are encrypted. As, many of, as, as, as much of the headers, header space that we can encrypt, we've encrypted it. Which means middle boxes can't see it and therefore can't ossify it. Definitely can't modify it, but they can't ossify it as well. So that's really, really, uh, that was an important thing for us. That was part of the evolvability equation for us. Um, but we had to have some things open because you need to have, you know, like a connection ID so that you can go find the key on the other side, right? So we had a flags byte. The first byte was a flags byte, right? That had some indications about how to read the rest of the packet. Um, there's a one byte that we left open. Guess what happened? It got ossified. And this was, this was like about a year, a little over a year ago now. Um, what happened was that there was a vendor that basically wanted to build a, you know, a feature to ship and to sell and say, they, you know, quick, we, we are building a quick classifier. They looked at Wireshark, they looked at the packet, they said, looks like the first byte is always seven. They, never read the spec. they didn't know the spec existed. <laughs> we talked to them. Uh, I'm not saying. Ask me offline. <laughs> no, there's, there's a real issue here, right? I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a big disconnect, and, and this is kind of the, the community. I, I've said this several times. Middle boxes have become accidental control points, meaning that they control the internet's architecture, and we don't realize it. But, but there's, there's a real issue here. They have, I've, I said this in a talk about seven years ago, that middle boxes have become architectural control points for the internet. And it's still the case. We still don't know how to exactly run around them. We are trying things, but we don't know yet. Question. Um, there was an article a couple of weeks ago from, I think it was a TOS guy, who said they were considered, he suggested randomly varying options yes. to get around stuff like that. Yes. Yes, Greece. 
So greasing is a so that's called greasing. Uh, the 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 uh, making yes that's that's. Um, Sorry? Oh, repeat the question for the mic. Yes, thank you for reminding me of that. The, uh, the, the question was, there was some TLS uh, guy who had talked about uh, uh, using random options in TLS to, to, to defeat middle boxes that might ossify. And, and I said, yes. And somebody from the audience shouted, grease. And I said, yes, exactly. This is called greasing. And this is something that we are trying to make a, a critical part of quick as we are going through the IETF process. We just this week we had the IETF the, uh, the interim meeting in Melbourne, which is why I happened to be in Australia, um, and they and we were talking about how to do greasing, and we are going to be doing that in the IETF protocol as we go forward. So yes, we are going to try and defeat this problem, this exact problem, um, and I want to be clear that encryption is our defense against network ossification. We might need greasing as well, but even there, you, have, you really want to be able to encrypt as much as you, as you possibly can, because that's the only defense that we have left against network middle boxes at this point. Um, and I'm going to leave it at that and take more questions. We have five more minutes left, I think. Four and a half minutes. <coughs> Question. Are, are, you, are there any quick web servers available to the public? Yes, all Google servers. All of them? Yeah. Apache and everything? Oh, no, 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 what I meant to say was if you want to speak quick to a Google server, the Google server will speak quick back to you. Yes. You're asking about implementation, yes. though. Yes, there are. They are in production ready at this time yet, uh, but they are under development. So there's QuickGo, there's, uh, there, there's folks at Apple who are working on an implementation for ATS. Um, so the, at the quick working group, we also have this interoperability. Uh, we also do an interoperability testing. So we've had Apple, Microsoft, um, Facebook uh, bring their own implementations. Apple's server one is ATS. So that's happening. Um, we'll see when it gets to the point of actually being production ready. But this is all work in progress. Question. Do you have any standard associations or bindings with HTTP2 or how HTTP2 should be carried over quick? Yes, we are working on a document right now that actually, oh, sorry, I should repeat the question. Thank you. Um, are there any standard bindings or any, 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 uh, uh, I'm going to paraphrase your question. Practices. Practice, best practice about how HTTP should be run over quick. That's for HTTP 2 to be run over quick. We actually have an HTTP 2 over quick mapping document in the, in the IETF process. So that's going to describe all of those things. I have two questions. The first is, is there a reference implementation that's open source we can look at? Uh, the question was, is there a reference implementation that you could look at? The Chromium one is, is our Google quick reference implementation. But it's not the IETF quick reference, uh, reference implementation. People are still building to IETF quick. So there's, 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 there are a few open source ones. Um, and Chromium, like I said, has the one that we use. But as Chromium also catches up with the IETF specification, that will be one implementation that you could use. The second question is, this has been mostly about HTTP over quick. What other protocols could you put on top? OK, the, sec the second question is, this has mostly been about HTTP over quick. What about other protocols? They're definitely on our radar. We are looking at other protocols inside Google. Right now, um, with the one that's of immediate interest is WebRTC and, and, and other stuff. And, and that's, that's something that, that even folks uh, at the IETF are very interested in. At the moment, for the IETF process, we are constraining ourselves to HTTP2 just so we can get some stuff done. And I didn't mean, yeah, so, so we, we will expand that scope immediately after a quick V1, as we call it, and then immediately move on to more applications. Question. Yes. How does the client choose to try quick or use HTTP2 or fall back to HTTP1? Is there a whitelist or is there a. So the, so, you, so the question was about how does a client choose to use either quick or, or, or TLS, given that it has the option of choosing them? We, at the moment, so Chromium does it a particular way. Chromium basically always prefers quick. Um, but you could do a number of things, but this is a host local policy to some degree. The way that we do it right now, the, uh, that, that, that Quick does this right now, is the server will advertise Quick availability over HTTP. So the negotiation, the way negotiation happens is Quick will say, uh, uh, serve an HTTP response and say, all service, I'm also available to speak Quick. So the next time the client is speaking, the client can choose to try over Quick as well. So that's how it works right now. Question in the back there. Does 
The question is, does Quick do anything to facilitate content caching? It does not explicitly do anything for content caching. Effectively, the surface that you're looking at is HTTPS. So to the extent that HTTPS, you know, whatever HTTPS does is what Quick will do below it. The question about how to cache and how to use HTTPS content, that's a question I think that you're asking. And Quick doesn't do anything different about that. Well, it's a good question, though. And it's something that I think the community on the whole is interested in trying to figure out how to solve. One more question. One more question. Orange shirt. Yes. Uh, yes. So the question is: uh, um, There's there are high speed, uh, sorry, high speed and high latency links. Uh, I call them high BDP links, large BDP links, and these are basically like Australia, for example, where you might have a satellite connection, for example. Um, and what can be done to facilitate that? That's, so that's why we wanted congestion control agility. So this is really, in my mind, a congestion control question. You can't, you, we try to get as close to fewer round trips as possible. So the longer, longer the, the latency, the better the benefits you have, as, as I pointed out earlier, because you are basically doing zero RTD and various other things. But you also want to do changes to the congestion controller potentially to make it RTD independent. That's other work that we are working on. So that's BBR as an example of this. You, some of you may have heard of this. But we are doing other work to try and, 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 and make congestion control itself better. Quick provides agility, meaning that you can experiment with your own congestion controllers. You can build it in user space. There are a number of things one can do uh, to play around with this. But that's, that's uh, I think, quite a significant value add we found. It doesn't solve the problem, of course, but because the fundamental problem is, I think, a theoretical one. Okay, I think we're just about out of time. We're passed out of time. So I think everybody had a pretty good talk. And uh, show you. Thank you.